So welcome back everybody for another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. We're very happy to have Martin Wolf with us, the chief economic commentators from the Financial Times. Hi, Martin. Hi. Martin will talk about what's the matter with uh, Great Britain. So we will hear a lot about the UK today and try to understand uh, you know, the developments from the past and going for, into the future for the United Kingdom. I would uh, like to give some few opening remarks. Of course, what comes to mind, you know, if you look at some major events occurring in the UK is not only Brexit. I think one is that at some point the UK was very much focused on Asia. It was supporting the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank against, you know, the US and was very much pro-China. So it was focused on Asia. Then there was a major Brexit event, of course. Then more recently in, in the fall this year, in the autumn this year was the mini budget. And you know the guilt scares so that the guilt interest rate was going out of control, uh, and the pension funds were struggling. So, but that's you know some major zigzag going back and forth. And the question is a little bit, you know, the traditional strength of the United Kingdom was the pragmatism. Is the UK, you know, the battling to find the right growth model, how to go forward? And I outlined potentially three different ways one could go forward. One is. A country strategy could be that you focus very much on technology. The 21st century will be all about life sciences. And if you think about Cambridge and, and uh, Cambridge University around that, it's all about life sciences. If you think about deep mind, IT, UK is very uh, leading on this. But of course, there's also green technology. And the UK could be contributing to become a standard setter in this way. Another uh, growth model would be to focus being a tax haven, and this way you also make sure that the financial center in London stays one of the major centers this way. That's another way uh, to move forward. Or the third way to become somehow a European bridge to Asia, uh, that is close connection to Asia and coming through, essentially, the UK will play a major role on that. So these are different ways to go forward. There are probably many more, but there are just uh, three ways to go forward. All of them have actually some implication what cooperation you need. If you really want to set some standards in all the technology side, you have to cooperate a lot with the United States, uh, to some extent also to Europe, but there is a lot of new technology. Uh, you can't set alone essentially standards from the UK perspective. If you go for a tax haven strategy, then you will confront in particular Europe and also the United States. And if you go for this bridge to Asia strategy, it might be in conflict uh, to uh, the United States. So in all of these examples, there are very different implications. In particular, there are very different implications with regard what's the interaction with geopolitics. If you think about geoeconomics, so there would be very different uh, implications for you know, the geopolitical implications. And we know the United Kingdom is a very important the geopolitical power uh, as well. And that has implications. So the economic strategy has feedback and implications also for uh, you know, the geopolitical interactions with all major players as well. Now, the other aspect I would like to emphasize is the global trade aspect. So the global trade is, is very important. And of course, the UK has a big current account deficit. And the question is, if we go to a bipolar world, if the global framework will be fragmented or deglobalized, is this hurting the United Kingdom or Britain in, uh, more generally? Um, because, you know, if you have a smaller country, you don't have such a big home market, it might, you might rely much more on globalization. And, and Britain could be a free trade champion, and also because it has the Commonwealth connections, it has English as a common language, which is used across the globe. So it's very natural to uh, also for the service sector, which is now becoming more and more important for globalization, that the uh, UK will play an important role. And as I mentioned, there's this ongoing current account deficit, which is, you know, uh, over years. So it also makes the pound essentially vulnerable. Uh, and also because uh, the guilt might not be a safe asset or reserve currency. So it does not it has the same exorbitant privilege like the US Treasury has. And that makes uh, is, is another challenge. And we could see uh, the challenge in October 2020 when the yield for the uh, British uh, treasuries were spiking. So on the reason for this spike was either a fiscal situation because of the mini budget, or it was a current account situation, or it was a financial stability issue because the pension funds, LDI, 
investment structure caused some financial stability issues. And there was a three-sided game of chicken going on between monetary dominance, fiscal dominance, and financial dominance. So the central banks were actually, the Bank of England had some game of chicken going on with the government. And at the end of the day, one could argue that monetary dominance prevailed or the Bank of England prevailed, uh, you know, at the, the Bank of England didn't have to give in. It could stand its uh, uh, strategy to fight inflation, uh, and the government at the end had to resign. So there essentially is a very nice classic example playing out right now about these different dominance schemes. And of course, financial dominance played a role too, because the Bank of England also tried to force the pension funds to recapitalize some of the LDI schemes. Now, I think overall, I think the UK is resilient. It can bounce back. And what's, of course, the adaptability and agility and the pragmatism, which actually helps uh, the United Kingdom uh, to bounce back. So with this opening remarks, I would like to go to the poll questions uh, you answered. And thanks again for everybody for participating in this poll questions. And here are some questions Martin put forward. And I put some one and I added to one to that. Will the UK rejoin the European Union single market before 2030? Yes or no? And 30% thought yes, and but 70% thought no. Will the Northern Ireland protocol be abandoned? Yes or no? And actually, the outcome is exactly 50-50. So 50% said yes and 50% said no. The third question was, can the UK recover the pre-financial crisis growth rate of GDP per head? So not the level, but just the growth rate, yes or no? And 38% said yes, but 62% said no, which you know is quite a significant number. And finally, did the UK growth strategy, will it be most successful if it's technology focused? That's 47% thought. Deep mind, Scandinavians essentially following a Scandinavian approach. A tax haven focused strategy, that's what 13% thought. A bridge to Asia focused, 13%. And other focus was 27%. So with this brief opening remarks, we are very excited to hear what Martin has to say. And um, of course, he's one of the experts following the UK economy. So we are learning a lot. And I really appreciate for being with us. Thanks again, Martin. Always yours. Okay, so it's a great pleasure to be with you. And that's an excellent introduction. Um, most of all, because it doesn't really overlap with my presentation. So it leaves us plenty of questions to address later on. And I have to say that I would broadly agree with the conclusions given um, by the viewers to the polls. So I think those are pretty, pretty sensible. And I might make a comment if I've got time either at the end of my presentation or in our discussion uh, about um, why of these strategies, the least unlikely is the first. I think the, the second and third are, we're going to do a bit of both, but that we're not going to be able to do much. Uh, but I tend to believe that for a country of, of the UK size, it's not Singapore, it, you're never going to end up with just one strategy. It's inconceivable. Mm -hmm. There will be no political consensus on it, um, at least not in a messy democracy. And my God, we're a messy democracy like most other democracies. Okay, I'm going to... Uh, um, uh, um, go with uh, sharing, and I hope, uh, why isn't it coming up? Ah, yes. Okay, here we are. And I'm going to start my slideshow. And basically what I've got here is a lot of slides, and my purpose is really to explain to the audience what has been going on and where we are. And there's a little bit about the challenges, but as I said, that should provide a good background. I'm basically assuming that lots of you really don't follow the UK. Um, you know, not that important the country when all said and done, and certainly haven't followed the history of the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years and, and the more recent history. So I'm just going to tell you a lot of stuff. I put together about 40 slides. It's ended up as 28, so I'm going to have to go through fairly quickly but you're all used to use looking at these things, so I'm sure you'll be able to follow very closely. So uh, Marcus started off with this question, what is the matter with Britain? And my immediate reaction is it's absolutely nothing. I mean, it's, it, it's all just what you'd expect. So essentially, uh, my view of Britain, uh, and I have this view for the last, um, let's say, half a century, uh, since I was at Oxford, it's uh, just a declining great power. 
it was uh, uh, a preternaturally powerful country 150 years ago, uh, leading economic power, the the the, the launch uh, launch pad for the industrial revolution, um, emerging democracy, and um, just ludicrously powerful in the world influence. So well, then it's causing it to be in steady and ineluctable decline. Uh, and I think by comparison with most great powers in decline, it's been reasonably elegant. I mean, I would suggest you just look at Russia, um, Turkey. Um, I'm not even sure about the US, but I will leave that to the side for the moment. Uh, um, and my view is uh, that basically our self-perception has consistently lagged about a generation or two behind reality. And that's not surprising because, well, an increasing proportion of the population is over is over 40. And so they don't really understand where we are. It is finds it very difficult to recognize that some of its core weaknesses are actually the mirror image of its historic successes, particularly institutionally and politically. And I hear I'm going back to the 19th century. Um, and of course, as Marcus already recognized, there is a, a great deal of nostalgia, particularly in our elites, um, not in much of the country, I think, but in the elites. Um, but, uh, and that influences politics profoundly. I think most uh, developed democracies now seem to suffer from this because, well, they are in relative decline. Apart from all, all that, well, I would say that one of the great achievements is we've got a true, rid of a truly lousy prime minister who had no idea what she was doing and a chancellor ditto without any bloodshed in 44 days. Um, and we moved on. I think that's absolutely marvelous. And politically, at least, it looks far healthier than the US. So I've just put this. This is a chart taken from Freedom House, which uh, is, of course, a well-known American think tank, partly government funded which looks at the quality of democracy. And here is a ranking of major developed countries, all the G7 plus, I think, Australia. Uh, and this is from just before COVID. So I didn't want to get COVID to mess it up. And you can see we're sort of in the middle there, very close to Germany, a bit ahead, a bit ahead of France. And that's roughly what I would have uh, expected. And the US is looking pretty sick. So we're sort of not that terrible. Now for the economic stuff, I'm going to talk about the long-run economic performance of the UK economy in relative terms, how it performed after the financial crisis, which has been pretty grim. I think it's very important. What we know about what Brexit has done, I stress, I can only show a few aspects of this, but a number. And finally, I'll look at some challenges now. Um, and that overlaps with... Uh, what Marcus is talking about a bit, and then I'll go to the conclusion, which is a little punchier. So this is, I think, quite an interesting long run picture. This is from the work of Nicholas Crafts, a very well known academic uh, economic historian here in Britain. Um, I think many of you must know his work. So um, the, in, this, in this, the UK is at zero, uh, consistently at zero. And the other countries, US, France, and Germany, are relative to the US, to the UK. So back in 1870, GDP per hour worked in the UK was way above levels in France and Germany and somewhat above the US. The US surpassed it dramatically to reach a relative peak in 1950. Uh, uh, and the two continental countries finally caught up with Britain in, in the 1970s. We all know that. The really interesting point is in the last 50 years, the relative position vis-a-vis -vis the continental countries has changed very little. Basically, they're 15% higher in GDP per hour. Uh, there are obviously other measures. Um, and the US has fallen, uh, though it's risen noticeably but in the last 15 years when its productivity performance is somewhat better than the other than the European big, big countries, but the US is very close to Germany and France and Britain is a bit behind. So in the long period, catch up followed by relative stagnation over a pretty long period. And the catch up was mostly done by the 70s. Um, the, the second thing is 
how has productivity developed in the UK compared with other major developed countries? And these are average growth of average output hour from the conference board since the 50s. So it's an average for the 50s, 60s, 70s. And of course, it brings out very beautifully what we all know is that Japan, Canada, Japan, Germany, Spain, France, and Italy had spectacular catch up periods in the post war period. And since and the US and UK, much less so. Um, they were more advanced and the UK was sleepy. And then there was a very considerable decline in the rate of growth of productivity in the last couple of decades, pretty well universally. The US least, uh, it was continually growing fast in the 2000s, much the fastest of these countries. And the UK, finally, in the last decade, the UK had a colossal collapse. Uh, from the uh, the 1990s down to 2000s and 2010s, and its growth of product output per hour is only a little bit above Italy. So the UK's productivity growth, thus measured, has fallen from being really rather good in the 80s and 90s to being really terrible. Um, and that's a long time process. One of the features of the economy, and which might explain at least part of this, because of course, productivity uh, out per hour reflects in some parts the vintage of your machinery, the vintage of your technology. Um, UK's investment rate is very, very low. Uh, and it has been very low for a long time. I've just gone over the last 23 years here. And you can see that the UK's average investment rate is the lowest. There was a period when Italy was a bit lower, but has risen a bit. Now, of course, countries like Japan invest a lot and they don't grow that fast. It's not a simple correlation. But the investment rate is really remarkably low. And that might be one factor in explaining the relatively low growth of productivity per hour uh, that I have shown you. Um, now, another feature of the UK, obviously, and partly related to low growth, but it, the other factor is inequality. And I'll come to that in a moment, which is, I think, an important feature of the economy. So uh, here, this comes from our Resolution Foundation. This shows growth rates over 15-year period. So basically, the increase in uh, GDP per head over 15-year periods. Every point is the previous 15 years, starting in 1976. So that includes the 60s. So what basically happened here, and I think what's important, are two things. In the, this is obviously what happened in the 1980s, above all under Margaret Thatcher, uh, and in the very early 90s, there was massive deviation in growth of household income per head in, uh, um, in the top decile and the bottom decile, and the medium was very close to the average for GDP per head. Uh, and during that period, there was a very, very large rise in household in income distribution, inequality of household income distribution. Uh, and I'm going to show you the end point of that. The UK had an inequality of household distribution in 1980, rather like Germany's better than France, and it's now considerably more unequal. So that's the first thing, that period, which really started in the Thatcher period of massive income distribution shifts uh, in a more unequal direction. In the last 15 to 20 years, as you can see, that divergence across income, this, across the, these parts of the income distribution, the median, the top decile and the bottom decile has disappeared, but the, it is instead, everybody is stagnating. So the last 15 years have seen uh, a very long period of stagnant real incomes, which of course you'd expect from what I showed on productivity. But for the UK, this is without doubt been the lowest growth of household incomes over 15 year periods. Towards the end, we're talking about the whole period from the financial crisis that we've had at least for a century and possibly since well before that, back into the 19th century. Can I ask a quick, quick clarifying question? Yeah. Is, if you take London out and if you take the financial sector out, is then this still is it a London effect, a financial sector effect, or is it it's more generally a, it's across? Certainly, England? London in significant part. I haven't seen a breakdown. I don't even know whether it even exists on a regional level for mm -hmm. this. 
I don't ha I I thought about but it scrapped the, uh, the charts on regional inequality. It's just too much. But it is true that the UK uh, is an exceptionally regionally unequal country by European standards, quite extraordinarily so. And it's not just London, it's London and the South East. So that's about a quarter of the country. And London is one of the richest places in Europe on every measure. I mean, and of course, our poorest regions are some really quite poor. Uh, and that clearly rose in the 80s and 90s. So I'm sure it's a significant factor. And that makes the inequality problem, it links with something else too, which was that in that period was in that we had a very quick period of deindustrialization in the 80s. Uh, I mean, which just collapsed. Uh, and that was a regional process because our industry was located in certain regions, which really and truly never recovered. Um, what I'm trying to emphasize, and I think that your question illustrates this, is there are very deep structural processes going on that explain some of the phenomena. They're not even the last 15 years, although that's very important, the stagnation. It has to do with structural changes in the economy over, I would say, actually probably 120, 130 years, but certainly the last 50, which make them much more difficult to change, of course. I just said I thought I'd put up something about inequality. So this was 2016, um, so rules out, and it just ranks the standard Gini coefficient inequality of household disposable income after taxes and cash transfers from the OECD. And you can see whether well, the US is at the top, not surprising, but the UK is well above all other uh, European uh, countries. You can see as you'd expect, the smaller countries are much more equal. Uh, um, as I said, the UK was quite close to France 40 odd years ago. It isn't now. And so that's really, and I think that's a significant factor in explaining, in explaining social pressures because with a lot of really, not a very high average income and with a lot of people who are really quite poor relative to the mean, and a much more, much less generous welfare state than most other European countries. You have a lot of people in Britain who are really poor by European standards, even if average incomes aren't that far below it. Um, and that creates political and social stresses and explains something I'm going to come to in a minute. Um, OK, I said I would discuss, um, I thought I should put this up just to illustrate my point about the tax burden, and that of course links to what welfare redistribution there is, and the quality of public services, which is linked uh, clearly to the standard of living at the bottom few deciles. And you can see that the UK is a relatively low tax country, uh, even um, though, of course, considerably above the US, which is low, um, and it would also be quite a bit above Australia. But it's well below um, uh, uh, quite a number of continental countries, um, fairly close to Canada. It's got that sort of state system. Uh, but the British think this tax rate is really far too high. And on the other hand, they really like the welfare state they have. They have, And I would say their biggest uh, strategic challenge might be reconciling their desire for low taxes with a continental size welfare state. Um, now, then I'm going to move to the financial crisis. So that's a long history. Now let's look briefly at the financial crisis. Um, Britain, as I've noticed, noted was very hard hit. And you can see that for the productivity numbers. This is another way of looking at the same thing, uh, which will appear in a book of mine that will be forthcoming in February, uh, a big plug called The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. Anyway. What I've done here is simply take uh, the deviations of actual GDP from the GDP that would have occurred if the trend growth of GDP between 1980 and 2007 had continued in that country. And interestingly, the only one of these countries where the deviation was essentially zero was Germany. And that's partly because growth before the crisis was really rather low. Um, uh, by 2018, US GDP uh, per head was 
15% below trend. Uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, the US was um, about 17, and the, but the UK was 22%. The ones worst hit of all were, of course, Italy and Spain because of the huge shock of their financial crisis. But GDP per head in the UK by 2018, in the later, in my book, I've got a more updated chart, which I hadn't wasn't able to insert in time, uh, was 21% below pre-crisis trends. That's a pretty dramatic shortfall from what people were expecting. But one could argue that the pre-crisis trends were a little bit excessive for some countries. Yeah, so. I think they were particularly excessive. And uh, I think the one of the most interesting questions is whether the collapse in GDP per head, which growth and real household disposable income we since since 2007 was a financial crisis induced shock, which it must be in part, or reflects the fact that a significant part of pre-financial crisis growth was an illusion. As I uh, have argued um, in the UK case, particularly some part of the 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 apparent income generated by the growth of financial sector was simply the conversion of money money and financial expansion, which was unsustainable, shown to be unsustainable, into incomes which were illusory. Mm. And I think it's pretty easy, you were an expert, to see how that would happen. And I think that must have been part of this story, and it is a big part. So if you even it all out properly, uh, you would get the conclusion that Britain never really caught up as well as we thought, and I'm going to come to this in a moment, the Thatcher revolution was much less successful than people thought. But I haven't seen a really good analysis of what that means quantitatively. So I'm just using the actual figures for GDP per head as they're reported uh, by the Eurostat. Okay. Um, now what has happened, now I'm going to move on to the last six years, um, because we had this secondary shock. We've had four shocks, the financial crisis, Brexit, COVID, and the energy shock, and I'll go through them all. So the uh, the UK has, of course, been, uh, this is growth in real GDP per head. Uh, um, this is the actual absolute increase. So. Uh, first of all, growth, the increases in the size of the economies between GDP, in GDP head between 2016 and 2022 have been pretty miserable almost everywhere. In the UK, they were about three and a half percent. UK is not dramatically bad. Uh, it's actually ahead of Japan, Spain and Canada, not far below Germany. Italy, of course, was helped by the recovery from the financial uh, crisis to some degree. But um, the UK is pretty low down in a very miserably performing bunch. Um, and this uh, just looks at the COVID period. Uh, it's taken from my, a, a column by my friend and colleague, Chris Giles, and it includes the OECD average. And this is, the, uh, this is GDP, uh, not GDP per head. And you can see that the UK is the only one of these economies whose economy in the third quarter of 2022 was still smaller than it had been in the fourth quarter in 2019. Though Germany is vastly better, but the EU as a whole, Italy, uh, Canada, France, and the US above all, look much, much better in the terms of the scale of their recovery. So these figures suggest pretty strongly that UK performance since the Brexit year has been pretty poor, not colossally poor, but pretty damn poor. And the post-COVID recovery has been very weak. Another thing that is pointed out, which is, uh, in, and Mark has already mentioned this, is uh, the exchange rate, uh, uh, the effective exchange rate for sterling fell sharply at the time of the referendum. Uh, uh, that was the, the most obvious way in which uh, markets adjusted uh, for the shock of the referendum through the exchange rate, which in my view was pretty desirable. And that's what good reason for having a currency, but it's another question. And, but, and you can see it's wobbled around quite a bit, but it's ended up uh, pretty well where it started uh, um, almost six years ago. So basically there was a downgrade of the currency reflecting, I think, in all probability, the Brexit shock. 
And that's where much of the adjustment occurred. Um, now, obviously, people are interested in the, sh the impact of Brexit at this very early stage. Don't forget, we only went through the transition pre period. It was the actual shock, though, of course, people could anticipate it at the end of 2020. Um, the general belief of, for what it's worth, and I don't think anybody knows, that the Bank of England, the OBR, Office of Budget Responsibilities, at the end of all this, the UK economy might be three or four percent smaller than it would otherwise have been because of the Brexit effect. My view is that's not wildly implausible, but really nobody knows. I suspect it might be a bit optimistic when all the effects run through, but there are so many unponderables about how this is going to play out. But we do know a little about trade. So people have done an analysis of this, which is quite interesting, which they constructed. It's obviously uh, a synthetic. Uh, what the UK would have done if it had been in the EU, what they call the doppelganger UK, and that's the, the pink line uh, for UK exports to the EU and UK imports from the EU. And then they've got the actual below. And the story seems to be from this that actual UK exports to the EU have lagged significantly below uh, the uh, um, what they would have been with this doppelganger. So there are export losses, which is what you'd expect, whether these are, uh, and basically exports from the UK to the EU have been pretty well stagnant over the last three or four years. And they are actually uh, way below in dollar terms where they were in 2019. Uh, interestingly, the imports from the EU have not been affected so much. And the main reason for that is we haven't imposed tariffs on the EU and the, uh, and the, the regulatory barriers have also basically not been introduced. So the UK has remained open to the EU. And I think that's shown pretty clearly here. Do these um, figures taking into account that the pound weakened and hence you would have expected the export to be flourishing? Yeah, the they, we... But we found even after uh, the financial crisis, another story that uh, while there's an adjustment mechanism in the currency, its impact on exports seems to be remarkably weak. Mm -hmm. And the supposition here is that, uh, well, and it's my theory that though it's an adjustment system, it, 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 um, uh, um, gives some reduction of pressure that to expand exports in a big way from a country like the UK, you need um, significant investment. And if mm -hmm. your trade environment is uncertain and the currency is very uncertain, companies don't invest. And this might well be one of the explanations for our very weak corporate investment. And in which case, it's the cost of, there's also a cost of exchange rate flexibility as well as an advantage. And I think that's an interesting um, hypothesis. Uh, this looks at real business investment sort of uh, um, in continuous time, just for the UK, it's not comparative. And the, the big story here is there was a reasonable recovery after the financial crisis. It topped out in real terms in 2016, and it's never got back, uh, 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 particularly, and this is particularly true, I mean, for business investment. Overall fixed investment has held up better because government actually increased its fixed investment. But even that, of course, essentially stagnated in the last three or four years. But private uh, business investment is being pretty depressed since the financial crisis, either stagnant or actually since COVID, um, significantly below the previous period. And that looks to me like a Brexit effect, which links with our discussion of um, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, this issue of the exchange rate. What place. This is, I think, fascinating. I don't want to go into too much time on this, but it, the, the, as you probably know, obviously, one of the great reasons for Brexit politically was to do something about immigration from the EU, which is the blue line here. Uh, by the way, the series aren't completely consistent, so there are breaks in it, but they're reasonably okay, I think. Uh, we're not quite sure. Um, uh, the big point is 
they really did reduce net immigration from the EU dramatically. As you can see, the blue line has fallen to zero and it hasn't picked up. Now the economy is open again in 2022 at all. Basically, net immigration from the EU is now negative, which I think is very, very sad. Um, uh, uh, the, um, but immigration from the rest of the world has exploded. Now, there are some special factors in this explosion recently, particularly uh, Ukrainian refugees from Ukraine and, and people in Hong Kong who have a, a right to um, citizen, right to citizenship to live here, which is excellent in both cases. But it's not clear here, even before these shocks, that uh, overall immigration is going to fall at all. It, it, just the composition is going to change dramatically. What that will do for the the, the quality of the labor force, the nature of the labor force, honestly, I think we don't know yet, uh, uh, but it does mean sh significant shortages in certain sectors of the economy, which came to rely on certain types of EU labor, particularly in the low, some of the low wage sectors. But overall, as a control of immigration, Brexit has clearly failed. Um, now, uh, uh, the, um, uh, this address is one of Marcus's questions. Uh, so I, I was interested in this question too. Um, uh, the markets very unkindly referred to what happened after the mini budget in September as the moron premium. Uh, there were obviously lots of things going on and Marcus has mentioned the pensions thing, uh, shock as well. So this is the UK 10-year gilt spread over French 10-year bonds. I thought that France is a pretty good comparator for us, uh, very, pretty, more similar to us really than any other country I can think of, and uh, something neither country wants to believe. And, the, um, and you can see there was a colossal spike up in the spread, uh, and Kwarteng was sacked, Hunt became chancellor, and... Uh, really promptly, there was a collapse in the spread in a very short period of time. And basically, this was a week ago, I think, basically back to where it was. That would suggest, in answer to his question, that the sense that this government was a rogue government, which wasn't playing by the rules and wasn't responsible, was the most important reason for this. And I think, uh, I, so I do think it was very much financial sector driven, though the Emergence of the bond crisis, of course, um, uh, exacerbated this. And uh, and whatever for whatever reason, but I think mainly because they got rid of these people and replaced it with people who didn't who, who play by the rules, talk the right talk about fiscal responsibility and all the rest of it. Um, the market seemed to have calmed down. Will that last? I don't know. One of my rules in life. Is what happened? What happened to the market. mortgage market? Is the mortgage market back and running again? And the yeah, mortgage rates are down too. Is definitely running back again. Of course, mortgage rates are higher because these are spreads. Uh, because, as you know, yields are higher yeah. and uh, short rates are higher, and bond yields have gone up with them. And of course, this is—I'm not going to have time to look at that because, but mm -hmm. that's of course a global phenomenon. And if I remember correctly, when I most of the U.S. yields are above U.K. yields, that's not particularly surprising. Uh, that largely reflects expectations of future uh, interest rates. Uh, I'll come to this inflation picture very soon, but I don't think anymore that there is uh, there is showing in the markets any sign that there's something, you know, that, and the things like that the UK has become an emerging market, by which they mean one that can't fund itself in its own currency. That doesn't seem to have happened. It could happen, but it hasn't yet. Now, a really important thing that is happening, uh, I'm now moving to challenges. So that was uh, the last of, uh, uh, so I've actually moved to challenges a little bit earlier. Uh, so I've just, that was the last Brexit. Now I'm moving to challenges with them, where we are now. This is about where we are now. Mm -hmm. And this is a really disturbing chart. Uh, and uh, I don't think you fully understand why this has happened. But basically, this is from my colleague, John Byrne Murdoch, who's done a lot of wonderful work. He basically shows that the UK is the only developed country in the world where the share of working age people outside the labor force kept rising after the initial pandemic shock. So unlike everywhere else, we're not on the pre-pandemic trend. 
A lot of the evidence, I had beautiful charts, but I had to get rid of it, suggests this is health related. And it's not clear whether this is because it's obviously partly because our health system has been colossally overburdened because underfunded. And it's partly, I think, a consequence of uh, the interaction of the pandemic with long term health deprivation in significant parts of our population for the reasons I discussed earlier, rising inequality, a rising regional inequality, which means concentrations of very poor public services, very poor housing, and uh, and poor diets and inadequate welfare support means you've got a lot of very unhealthy people, very similar to the US in this respect. Um, uh, and if you look down to the US, you see there's it's a huge rise, it's just falling again, and that's well known. So there are some similarities there. But the UK position on this is very disturbing and not fully understood. Um, uh, now, let me go to the challenges again. Obviously, we're going to be in recession, uh, and uh, and that's going to have big implications. And we've had to upgrade our update our forecast rather dramatically. And we and we did this. The OBR Office of Budget Responsibility did this with the autumn statement. And the, first, the chart on the left is, I think, very extraordinary. It sort of underlines something I showed earlier, but it's up to date, which is uh, the expected, expected growth of real household disposable income per person over the next two years, which are the red block uh, in the forecast zone. And basically what this says is these are cumulatively far and away the largest declines in real household disposable income after a long period when quarterly declines of this kind were quite common, as you can see, in far and away the largest since the war. And some estimates suggest that, that it's the largest since the 20s. So we're going to experience a dramatic decline in real household disposable income, and that will mean dramatic increases in significant poverty, at least by developed country standards, and worsening health will be part of that. And you can see, if you looked at the level of real household disposable income, that the um, uh, the November, November 22 forecast shows a dramatic downgrade from the March 2022 forecast. And right now, in a couple of years, it's expected the level will be back to where it was um, uh, uh, 10 years earlier. So 10 years of stagnant real household disposable income. Um, so that's going to be a big political thing. Now, the other, another, Big concern right now, obviously related to this, is what's going to happen to CPI inflation. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details of this rather beautiful chart about which are the OBR's forecasts, which are close to but a little more optimistic than the Bank of England, at least le less optimistic. But basically what it shows is a massive spike in the UK, uh, really unlike the US, um, uh, more like Europe, but not quite. Other, other non-tradable service sector is rather unimportant in the inflation boost. It's mostly food, beverages and tobacco and gas episodes, food and, uh, and energy uh, and fuels uh, and the other tradables, which are the, the, the consequence of the COVID shock and this inflation in goods. Um, so there is a relatively optimistic view that the baseline effect will mean that inflation will start falling in the course of next year and get back to trend with only a modest tightening, bringing down the other non-tradables, particularly uh, to um, so the inflation that the, the uh, base rate might not peak at much over 4%, 4.5% and inflation will go away. It will then rise again, but not above 2%. So this is a relatively benign view of the inflation outlook, but it will still mean because these massive real rises in prices and we have a terms of trade shock, that real incomes are going to be dramatically reduced and it's going to be worsened by Bank of England uh, tightening, which is Moses, but still will have a significant effect. As Marcus suggested, and it's very important in considering the vulnerability of the UK economy, we run enormous current account deficits. Uh, uh, and I have here show the components of those, the very disturbingly large net investment income, uh, yet negative. Um, uh, the service sector uh, is only, the only one with significant positive items. So it's, it's forecast to be 6% uh, of GDP 
And that means, as uh, Mark Carney famously said, we depend on the kindness of strangers. Well, pro pro profoundly, we, we, we depend on the confidence of strangers. And so far, that more or less worked. Now, a big consequence of the crisis and the long lags, the long period of very weak growth and the social pressures created by this is that public spending uh, is rising. Um, as a share of, uh, of uh, GDP, um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the levels are running about 40% of GDP, not very high by European standards, but of course there are huge fiscal deficits here, but there have been big increases now forecasts and they're going to go end up at levels public spending as a share of GDP. We haven't seen really since the mid 70s. Uh, uh, and that of course has implications for taxation or, um, or borrowing. This government is committed to- So when you management. give your inflation numbers, they Sorry? don't take into account the budget deficit age here. I mean, if you Sorry? believe in, in some fiscal theory of the price level aspects, that fiscal deficits ultimately at some point will lead also to high inflation. Yeah, I'm not entirely convinced of this theory, but you can tell me yes. that you do, you are. Um, but I'm not going to discuss the fiscal, the, as things stand at the moment, there will be very large fiscal deficits this year and next, and are then expected to fall steadily. It is possible that those will show up in significant inflation one way or the other. I'm not completely persuaded that that will be the case. Uh, but uh, um, it's certainly an argument that we'll have. If that happens, either public spending will have to be cut a lot, which will, I think, lead to the toppling of the government, or they will have to raise taxes a lot, and that might also be to the toppling of the government. I'm going to come to that in a moment. Um, UK net public debt, of course, has risen dramatically since 2007, as you can see if you look down this chart, but it's not dramatic by the standards of other developed countries. Is this too much for a country that is a large net external debtor with a large current account deficit? Who knows? But it, it isn't the case that our debt position is dramatically out of line. Uh, but of course, it's worse than Germany or the Netherlands or Australia or Canada, but it's quite a bit better than the US, Spain, France, Italy or Japan. Um, okay, I'm getting very close to the end. The big issue for the future, far and away, in my view, of, of all, is what's going to happen to potential output, uh, average output growth in the future. The, uh, as you can see here, if you believe these numbers, uh, the 1980, 1998 to 2007 period uh, had a very positive uh, growth. Um, a lot of it was because of labor hours supplied, a lot of that was immigration, not much was capital deepening, and a lot was ta total factor productivity, which might be this financial sector, hocus pocus. But it fell dramatically between 2010 and 19. It was almost all labor hours. Labor productivity growth was, as I've already showed you, about half a percentage point a year at most. And the forecast is it'll be still lower. And the main reason it'll be still lower is labor force supply, labor force growth will stop, um, uh, partly because of the aging of the British labor force and partly because immigration, it is expected, will finally be brought under control. Uh, if these figures are correct, um, GDP growth will be modest and GDP growth per hour will remain also very modest uh, and capital deepening will remain off, but part of that very um, very weak. And um, that implies something not much better than a little more than stagnation, a little better than stagnation in terms of real incomes uh, per head and real disposable incomes. Okay, finally, so that's the review of I, what I think are the challenges. If you look at it, how do we get growth up, which uh, Marcus raised with his views of the, of the strategies, uh, uh, what, what's, what's involved in getting growth up, um, uh, how big will the Brexit effect be, um, can we overcome the major regional and other inequalities we've experienced, can we get productivity growth going again? And what would the strategies involve? But it's pretty clear to come back that the hope that the Thatcher revolution 
led to would lead to some fundamental and permanent transformation didn't work out. I don't have didn't have the time to keep all these charts, but we still have essentially the Thatcher era, post-Thatcher era of tax rates. Um, they're not wildly different. Um, we the, the companies that were privatized are still privatized. There's no be no real reversal of this revolution except Brexit affects clearly some important um, things. Our tax average tax rate remains relatively low by developed countries standards. The regular the OECD um, indicators of regulatory sort of stringency in the UK are relatively low. So it doesn't look as though our relatively poor performance is essentially because we've got a sectionally highly taxed and rigid over-regulated economy. That doesn't seem very plausible. So the strategy we're gonna to have to pursue, I think is gonna to have to be quite different from the one that we were pursuing uh, in that in the post-Thatcher period and the Quateng um, trust theory that slashing a few taxes, getting rid of bank bonus taxes would transform British growth is in my view a complete fantasy. The final thing I wanted to say in this is, uh, uh, this is I think really interesting because it bears on the first couple of questions you were asked to answer. Uh, these are the very, uh, some very recent polls, and you've got all the dates, on whether people think we should rejoin the EU or stay out. And there's no doubt in the last year or so, most a year or two, there's been a very big, a sensible shift in public opinion, though it may well still be soft. It is worth remembering at the beginning of the referendum campaign, the majority of polls were showing that Remain would win. But if that continues or gets more serious, then you can begin to imagine that politicians will at least start thinking about the single, the single market and maybe even in the next decade start thinking about reversing the Brexit. Though I myself think there are just stupendous obstacles to that because there are so many passionate opponents. And my own theory view is that the EU would be crazy to take us because we are so difficult. And the final thing then, let me just go through the conclusion. The long story is one of relative decline, very roughly speaking. The Thatcher revolution did not give enduring benefits. On the other hand, it stopped the relative decline vis-a-vis -vis continental Europe by and large. The period after the financial crisis has been particularly poor in terms of economic performance. And I, as I said, the Thatcher revolution certainly greatly increased in inequality. Um, and I think some of that was really stagnant or falling real incomes for significant parts of the population. So I showed you um, the Brexit referendum and its result um, were, and today chickens coming home to roost, uh, that is to say failures to to provide decent incomes and opportunity for quite significant parts of the country. So a lot of the wor old working class voted for Brexit. And that was allied to, of course, demagogic tomfoolery and outright lies. The economy has certainly performed relatively poorly since Brexit. How much of that's due to Brexit, we don't know, but it must be a factor. Our energy price is big and expensive. I think it'll ultimately be manageable without fiscal disaster, but a lot of people will be worse off, as I've shown you, and there's a huge inflation spike associated with this, which will, I think, disappear, but unless it actually goes to negative inflation, there's a permanent rise in prices, permanent shift in the terms of trade, that might not end, which makes us permanently worse off than we'd otherwise been. But the challenges are renewing inclusive growth and in relation to that, resolving the Brexit conundrum simply because it's poisoning our politics and making it very difficult to focus on any other policies. In response to Marcus's strategic questions, I don't believe in single strategies, so I tend to go for all of them. Um, uh, we're not going to go for Singapore on Thames, um, not even Switzerland. I think the tax haven approach is going to be so unpopular with the EU and the US that we can't really do it beyond what we're doing it anyway. I think the promoting um, tech innovation and so forth is very promising for us and we have to do that. But the big problems is none of that is going to generate a lot of incomes for the bulk of the less educated population. And unfortunately, 
long-term failures in education, which I hadn't had time to discuss, make it very difficult to restore um, really first-rate go jobs for non-university educated people and even quite a lot of university educated people. So in all, sobering, difficult, uh, not very optimistic about a glorious future, but I'm not sure that will be vastly worse than I would say about a number of other uh, high income European countries, um, uh, which also have a lot of, some, um, if not many of these uh, problems. As to the longer term political stability of the nation, well, those are some big questions. Will it remain together? Will Scotland become independent? Will we get more populism even um, with all the social hostility we're seeing in the US? I think not. But, uh, I think we're also in a period of quite new and difficult challenges to long period of stagnation, which Britain is not used to historically. So I hope that gives you a sense at least of what's the yes. matter with Britain or at least what's been going on. Thanks a lot, uh, Martin, for this great tour de force across many, many, many aspects of uh, in Great Britain's uh, economy. Let me just zoom in on this inequality aspect. So two aspects. Uh, one is, is there a tension? So how progressive is the tax level? You said is low, but how progressive is the tax? Are the taxes it's in the United quite Kingdom? quite progressive. I, that one of the charts I had to get rid of was a very nice chart for direct taxes. Mm -hmm. That value added, of course, taxes are regressive and are property taxes. But for direct taxes, surprisingly, art, uh, a comparative chart that I can send you, um, but that's, those were part of my 40 charts, it shows that, to my surprise, actually, uh, because we have very high income tax thresholds and, ins and our social insurance charges are relatively low, mm -hmm. that the direct taxation uh, sort of shares of income taken by taxes up to the median income are relatively low by uh, um, continental standards. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the main, uh, of course, the not true for the US. So actually, um, the tax system is not particularly regressive. It seems to be um, the 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 um, what what some of us here call pre-distribution, i.e. incomes generated within the market economy are, have been the dominant uh, factor. I didn't go into wealth inequality. That's a whole different story, very complicated um, and uh, quite difficult to read it because house prices play a big role and so forth. And there's a huge tension between if you were to follow a strategy of having more tax haven or to, uh, not uh, at least going in this direction a little bit with the inequality component. I think so it's impossible. That. I mean, I think it is. So the British guy, I haven't had to time to discuss the strategies and debates. The British government is moving towards creating investment zones or enterprise zones, they changed the name, mm -hmm. which are relatively small areas which will have tax haven status. Though, as far as I can see, they're basically corporate tax status havens, not income tax status havens. That, I think, is going to be out of the question. Um, we've got our own income tax uh, haven status through the, the non-DOM regime, which allows people who are deemed to be not domiciled, and many foreigners coming to work in Britain are deemed to be non domiciled to escape income taxes in large measure for a long time. So that is a tax haven status. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, it's these idea of enterprise zones uh, for, um, uh, and uh, they may encourage some movement of investment into those zones, uh, losing some revenue. But um, the, we're, not, we're not thinking of tax haven status on, as I said, on direct taxation, um, which I think will be politically explosive. Um, we've obviously got all sorts of tax tricks in our capital gains tax system, carried interest taxation. I mean, there are a whole slew of stuff like that, like everywhere else. 
So really, if you're a very rich person and you pay tax, you are a fool. Uh, we've got those sorts of things, but really aggressive tax havens designed to make us a, uh, uh, a trap for FDI, as Ireland has been, I think has not been considered. Uh, it, there will be two problems. It would affect revenue, uh, and we hope to get revenue from cap, cap corporation tax, rightly or wrongly, I think um, probably largely wrongly. But it also would run directly into the direction that the US, in particular in the Europeans, have been pushing. Um, so we need the revenue to support the welfare state, and we want to, we don't want to break on corporation tax. Um, well, we're not, our, re our rates are now going to be well or high. Above that, we could lower them. That would lose some not insignificant revenue. And the problem the British government has, I don't think that they would get away with cutting spending significantly because social distress is such and is affecting marginal seats quite dramatically. That's a political judgment. So if they did cut taxes in some areas, they'd have to raise them somewhere else. I think that's possible. I think land taxes could be greatly increased, but it would mean a major restructuring of the tax system that nobody has been willing to think about because in a stagnant economy, it means you have a lot of big losers. And then in introducing a tax reform, which is designed to raise revenue and creates a lot of big losers is politically nightmarish. But as I said, cutting spending is also politically nightmarish. So I think the government is sort of stuck on this. And if the economy doesn't recover in such a way that spending on relatively cyclically related welfare spending uh, doesn't fall and cyclically related uh, revenue doesn't rise, then the British government will have some really big problems in the next uh, government. But, but the special zones are primarily for real physical investment FDIs right. or it's they're also for financial As schemes? As far as I can see, it's real physical investment. No one is suggesting, and I haven't looked at the details of these proposals as far as I can see, that the whole city, you know, we can make Canary Wharf for special mm -hmm. enterprise zone. Yeah. So that will clearly be possible. But the, the financial sector is such an important source of revenue for the British government, even after the crisis. I just can't imagine they could do it. Okay. Basically, so they're in a public finance trap at a lower level. But my sense of it is... Uh, that looking at the US, looking at continental Europe, pretty well all the larger countries are in this situation now. Yes. So moving to the next topic, which would be a free trade. So, you know, if the world becomes more fragmented, polarized, and um, is it much harder for the United Kingdom to, you know, be in a, being a small, relatively small country compared to the big blocks? <laughs> And or can it be playing some role there to keep the, the world open, essentially? If you just think about the uh, Inflation Re Reduction Act in the US, which you know makes it much harder to export for Europeans to, to the US and so forth, and probably the Europeans will respond to that. How will the UK in between somehow manage that? Or will it be a beacon of free trade? Or what, where do you envision the UK playing out? That is a fantastically good question to which, as far as I can see, the UK currently has no answer. Mm -hmm. I think the instinct after, let me go back. The world that was assumed to exist during the Brexit campaign pretty obviously does no longer exist. So the assumption back in 2016 is that we would be a beacon of free trade. Uh, we would be global Britain, which was the mm -hmm. phrase used. And that meant pretty clearly a lot of the Brexit pro-Brexit economies, so we would adopt even unilateral free trade in the 19th century model, and we would be open to China and Chinese investment and Chinese trade, and we'd be open to the US, and we'd have free trade areas with the world, and we would indeed be a beacon of free trade, though, of course, if you give away... Now, that immediately raised the question, well, if you give away all your barriers voluntarily, you can't negotiate, so you don't have much clout, and that already immediately after the Brexit referendum was over, struck home to people. So we didn't do much unilateral liberalization. We've done, we got a few very tiny, irrelevant free trade deals, uh, Australia notably. Um, can't remember where we are in Japan, but it's not gonna make much difference. Um, 
there's hope for India. None of these were important. Uh, the EU deal is a free trade agreement, but regulatory barriers are so important there. It doesn't help as much as you'd like. And there's clearly not going to be a free trade agreement with the US. And there's clearly not going to be a free trade agreement with China. So the that possibility of unwrapping us with free trade agreements in the whole the world is clearly gone. Global Britain in a globally open world is gone. Um, so I think there isn't a trade strategy anymore. Broadly speaking, um, what are the options? We keep our current tariffs, which are generally pretty low because tariffs are, um, and we push in the global context for general liberalization. The chances of that in the current environment seem to be near zero. zero. The, uh, we can, second, we can continue to pursue the free trade areas with everybody strategy. I just don't think there are takers. And, uh, and uh, there's clearly going to be a lot of pressure from the US and the EU not to do things that make us a Trojan horse for China. I mean, that's mm -hmm. I mean, increasingly obvious. So uh, that doesn't look very plausible. And on the other hand, the US is clearly not going to pass any liberalizing and negotiate uh, um, trade deal uh, in the foreseeable future. So that's out of the question. The third possibility is to try and improve our relationship with the EU. Uh, and the obvious thing to do there is say, well, we can't do deals with anybody else. Uh, and so why not join the EU Customs Union? That doesn't involve the problems with, with, uh, with um, uh, free movement. And uh, it will get rid of all the tariffs. It would solve. Would it the also resolve the Northern Ireland issue? Particularly if we adopted EU regulations on a on goods, which I think would be natural to go because mm -hmm. there's really no British industrial demand for having different product regulations and standards from those of Europe, which are, of course, their most important market. It's just costly nonsense. So we had the same food standards and the same manufacturer standards, then uh, the regulatory harmonization were possible. Now, of course, that creates the immediate the problem with the role of the ECJ. I'm not gonna go into all that. But anyway, getting closer to Europe would be a feasible strategy. And actually it seems to me the most rational strategy. And the final strategy is to forget all that and leave things basically as they are while at least resolving the, the Northern Ireland protocol problem, which probably does mean fixing the, the, the food standards issue. Those are, I think, the options. And at the moment, the, the British government is not prepared to consider them. But to me, in the world you described, um, at least in products for product trade, the only rational strategy is to get closer to Europe. Mm -hmm. But finance, you can imagine that you might not lose that much. We're not going to get into the financial sector regime. Uh, you're, you're dealing still in a world where capital flows are free. There are regulatory barriers, but they're not gigantic. So being an offshore center in finance uh, with London's sort of installed base, you lose something, but you don't lose that much. And um, in the context of generally better relations with the EU, maybe that would work. So I don't think we have to rejoin that. Um, uh, I, I don't think it's really feasible. That would involve the single European Act, but a uh, single, um, uh, single the Euro, uh, European, European Economic Area, almost certainly. But I think in goods, both with the Customs Union regulation, uh, and in a few other areas, we really have to get close to the EU. I can't see another rational strategy anymore. Mm -hmm. So final quick question is about education. Of course, UK is a fantastic elite education. How is the broad mass education? Is there, and is it also regionally very different? So is there challenges on the regional side? Very as interesting. Well? I'm not an expert. My wife is the expert in this area. Yeah. Um, there is evidence that in the last decade, to my great surprise, relative education performance in school has improved. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we've given a lot of decentralization to schools, a lot of decentralization. We've sort of imitated some of the best things of the charter school system. Mm -hmm. And Britain has moved up the ranks of PISA and others. And I mean, for example, to my absolute astonishment, according to Alison, I'm not my wife, um, we're ahead of France, which would have been unthinkable mm -hmm. in the past. Um, uh, so, but of course, improving our schools in the last 10 years, as, as obvious, affects the labor force very slowly. And, uh, and it, while we're trying to encourage an import of high skilled labor, and that may be, uh, that could be very useful, I think the instinct will remain to try and cut back again. So I'm not sure that immigration will be big enough to affect this. We have a very long tail of um, pretty poorly performing uh, pupils and many of them, of course, and people who are now in the labor force who came out of schooling the last 40 years, obviously include a great many who are really very, very poorly paid and in a very depressed regions with very few good jobs. And as my wife constantly tells me, and the US experience seems to show this very strongly that one of the best ways for people to get skills is to have a job. So if mm. they don't have good jobs, if they're doing very simple warehouse jobs, so forth, they're not going to get much skills. So there is some sign of improvement in school education. We have moved to a mass university system, and that's almost certainly improved the average level in the top half of the of the, of the uh, generate each generation, but that's relatively recent. And I think there's very real concern of whether the quality of elite education hasn't gone down. I believe it probably has. Uh, but on balance, things might be improving, but it will affect the labor force very slowly. And the problem mm -hmm. still is without, with large parts of our regions of our economy where the jobs being generated are so poor, but movement is very expensive because our housing market is so dysfunctional. So moving to London where there are lots of jobs, uh, but it's very expensive, people, just too expensive for people to live. So there are many obstacles to dealing with some of the problems we now face and they are interactive. That's the thing I've become more and more aware of is that these sorts of problems are not, don't come singly, they're interactive. So thanks a lot. I mean, let's uh, stop at this positive note. So education, at least there's one positive glimpse. So I think we should, uh, we have the tradition on this webinar that we stop at a positive note. So I thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. It was fantastic to get a great picture of what's going on in the United Kingdom. And of course, we're all hoping that, uh, you know, UK will move closer to Europe again. And that's, uh, you know, beneficial for everybody. Nobody can do that more than me, Marcus. As, as you know, I'm a very much yes. a passionate European. I like Europe today, and I think the idea that Britain doesn't fit within Europe, given any sense of its true history over the last 2,000 years, is just ridiculous. And I think Britain can contribute to Europe, and I sure as hell believe that Europe can contribute to Britain. This is a very painful rift, and I hope it will end. Let's work towards it. Thanks again, and I think you, you do a big part of it. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. Enormous pleasure. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. Great pleasure. Thank you.